Because the answer is kind of echoey. Kind of echoey? No. Huh. Uh, Kate, do you have headphones on? Now, it's still just as echoey. But if I have a headphone mm. on. Well, Kate just vanished. And I suspect when she comes back, it will not be echoey. But um, we're going to find out. No, it is. It is for me when I talk. It's for okay. echoey when you talk. Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure. Is is it routing through your headphones? This is not an internal microphone headphone. Hmm. I can hmm. get by as an audio. All right, we're going to get by. Yeah. And we're live. It is. Well, that whole thing was live, actually. It is Tuesday, <laughs> November 10th, 2020, 5.02 p.m. We're two minutes late because we're echoing. And uh, Kate's gone. She's vanished. Um, uh, we're going to try to bring her back. Um, yeah. Via but, uh, echolocation. Via echo echolocation. Um, Kate is... Uh, and she has a monologue for us um, because she was almost lost at sea today and wants to tell you about it. So, Kate, come back to us and uh, tell us the story of your getting lost at sea <laughs> and almost missing for the first time in 229 episodes. Uh, uh, oh, and she just lost her Internet. So, um, which raises the question of whether Kate, having succeeded in weathering a shipwreck and, um, and not getting lost at sea, has been felled by modern problems. Uh, so, in the meantime, I am just going to tell my side of the Kate shipwreck story, which is that about half an hour, oh, there she is. Oh, my Her God. internet is back. <laughs> She is not lost at sea. Kate, tell us the story. Oh, um, it's not that interesting. Uh, yes, it I, is. Kate, the part of Cape Cod I'm in has very radical tides. Like there are 14 feet differentials between the high tide and the low tide. So that means that like the currents are very strong bringing in the high and low tide because there's so much water to bring it back and forth. And um uh, because the sun is setting so early, I was going to have like one last go for a couple of days at um, having a high tide to go out and go canoeing in, in the little bay by my house. And so I, John was busy with work. And so I was like, I'll go out alone. And so like I got out there and promptly realized it was not anywhere near high tide enough, but I would paddle against this creek that like does like brings in the tide and I do that. So I did that for like an hour and it was beautiful and it was sunset and it was great. And I kind of looped around and I thought that I would be able to get back to like in front of where my takeout point is. And I was like a quarter of a mile away when I just beached and was just like stuck. And I sent you a picture of at that point. And it's a beautiful picture, but I'm just It like, is. Uh, it's a great picture of a lot of mud. <laughs> it's a great picture of a lot of mud. And I will show it now if I can share my screen. Um, no, it's not going to let me. <sighs> Anyway, well, I can I share it. Yeah, you can share it. So um, what you can't see in this picture is that like that, that those areas that look like, I don't know, water moving. That's just mud. That's just like mud flat, like mud. I couldn't get through it all. Um, Did you try to walk in it? Uh, yeah, that's a funny story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm like. Whoops. Um, have we lost Kate again? Muck. Yeah. Totally. No, I'm here. Yeah. Speaking here. of waiting sort through of. the muck, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Oh, uh, yeah, you're sort of there. Am I here? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Well, if I... Okay. So, anyways, so I tried to get out. You kind of, like, have to be very strategic, Mike, where you step. Because sometimes it looks sandy and like you're going to be able to step on it. And then you just sink up to like your th mid thigh in muck. And um, which is precise. So I tried to get out. I got out like on this tuft of like muscles and all this stuff. And I dragged the canoe out after me. And then I take like two steps and I just sink to like above my knee 
in like black, black muck. At which so point- I have an awesome picture of Kate <laughs> sunk up to her knee in black, black muck, but it's not letting <laughs> in an ad- in a in an internet conspiracy to save Kate's dignity, yeah. it is not letting me share it, we, which is a we, shame. We black Black right. Muck was UB40's less successful sequel to Red Red One. I want you to know. That's yeah, right. I'll post this on Twitter later. But and then at any point, a, like I like I at that point I couldn't portage it over the quarter mile that I needed to portage. It was pretty dark at that point. Like it was like. Meh, like about 15 minutes from full sunset and um the show was starting in 20 minutes and i was like so i called john and um yeah and so i called and john, john was like oh shit you have another sea turtle yeah no and john, <laughs> and john was just like uh yeah so anyways um no so john came down and laughed at me a whole bunch and took some pictures of me while I was stuck in the mud, that were pretty funny. That's the only only yeah. responsible thing to do. Which brings us to the main point here, Kate, which is that we're not allowed to have fun anymore. We are allowed, however, to I have smell Mike- like rotten eggs. Hi, Mike uh, Pesca. Yeah, to have <laughs> Mike Pesca and a lot of mud. Um, Mike Pesca, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. So you here's the, the, the feather in my cap, which I see Kate has beat me to. So oh, here's God, my question. Have it? Oh, I was you have a feather in your cap. <laughs> yeah, I found a turkey feather on the way down to the water. That was like, <laughs> an hour. That was like a life ago, Mike. That was like an hour. As she is wont to do. So here's my question to get us started. Are you in the, oh my God, there's a coup going on. The motherfuckers are stealing the election camp. Or are you in the death throes of the insurgency um uh they're like this is a form of psychotherapy for donald trump yeah. and you know mitch mcconnell licensed therapist is uh going through the motions of uh placating him you know for psychotherapeutic purposes camp if this is a coup it's a cuckoo coup or maybe it's a cuckoo cuckoo <laughs> meaning I am the walrus and I can't try to begin to understand what the symbolism is. But what I really think, uh, and within Slack, there's a debate, sorry, within Slate Slack, there is a debate and a lot of people are spiraling out, you know, based on this isn't good for democracy. Well, it's I not should, good for democracy. I think we can all democracy. agree on that. The To me, the possibility of this working is, I, I, mean, I could be wrong. But then again, I have no Nate Silver uh, percentages to go on, so that probably means I'm right. But the percentages of it working seems really so low that I'm not going to uh, allow it to occupy my brain. And I've even, I know there's a lot of criticism of McConnell and some of the other uh, Republicans, but I think they've all basically said the thing that you want them to say, given each of their position in the Republican firmament. So the three who are ever willing to break and do the right thing, right, um, um, Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins and Romney have done that. The McConnell has said, you know, things that you would wish you would use the phrase president-elect, but it's not as bad as actually uh, breathing the possibility of a coup into life. And then I'm sure I actually haven't heard Cotton and Hawley and some of that lot describing it, but um, I'm sure it's not good. So I think it's one of those things where if you ever hear a Republican official say president-elect about Biden, it becomes like magic speech and that's all you need to hear. And everything else is just a bunch of words to placate the baby. We just need to hear Biden call president-elect and then I go, whoop. So- on a scale of one to 10, where one is so complacent that you're in a, a sort of heroin induced uh, uh, stupor. Right. And 10 the safest is- safest place you could possibly be. Exactly. You're, you're in- <laughs> you're, nothing goes wrong from that. Captain Jack will get you high tonight, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> um, and, and 10 is, um, you know, uh, is so stressed out that you're having a panic attack uh, and um, uh, unable to control your own breathing. Where are you on the electo stressometer? Right. 
I'll disclose that I have a normal body temperature of about 96 degrees, which is true. And I have a normal resting heart rate that's a little low. I just don't get excited about things. So knowing that, I'm a one and a half. Wow. So you've had a fair bit of heroin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're not skimping on the on the free base. Yeah, that might be a little bit of my uh, <laughs> constitutional analysis and a little bit of my China white intake. Yeah, I, I got gotcha. <laughs> you. Are you in Oregon? <laughs> <laughs> um, How about you? You're an expert who I'm supposed to ask this question to. Uh, so I'm, I am, I'm bewildered, honestly, because I don't, like, I look at the situation and I say there is no play here. This is the classic situation where in chess you fold, right? You, yes. you, this is a resigning position. Right, a decent you, opponent will offer a handshake. Exactly, yeah. you've got, there is no play. Um, there is, I suppose you could say if it came down to one state, you could make a play for, uh, you know, legislative intervention to appoint a slate of electors. But you got to get that done in a minimum of two or three states to be successful here. It ain't going to happen. Um, and so I don't understand the play. And yet, here's Mike Pence sending a letter to uh, the, uh, or an email to the Republican members of Congress saying, I look forward to continuing to work with you as president of the Senate. Um, and, um, and, you know, Mike Pompeo's out there promising a smooth transition to a second Trump administration. And the uh, head of GSA is saying there's no clear result of the election. And I, I do have this like, what planet are these people on? And why are they so apparently confident of what seems to me to be um, transparent bullshit um, as truth. And so I'm, I am confused and constantly looking and trying to figure out what I'm missing to the point that I spent a big chunk of today reading local press in Georgia and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Arizona, trying to figure out whether there was any ongoing legislative action there um, and so I'm, I'm, I confess I'm quite confused. I mean, I guess this is why, and they always say that like the most amazing kind of part of the American experiment is that we have this peaceful transition of power, that one person steps away and another person kind of, it's, it's always easy to assume power, right? Like, or not easy, but like, it seems like a much more enticing proposition <laughs> than stepping away from it. And so I'm very kind of confused as to like, this actually seems to be part of the entire thesis of like the ways in which the norms of the presidency are, are um, not enshrined in law. And it seems to be, if we make it through this period, a really good argument for making this, uh, putting into law more parts of this transition at the very least. Uh, I don't know if, I mean, not that we talked about this yesterday, right, Ben, about how this was how the 25th Amendment kind of came, came into, um, came into being. Yeah, the 25th Amendment came into being because John F. Kennedy was shot. Right. And people said, it, it was a weird reaction, which was, holy shit. What if he'd gone into a coma and not died? Like, we knew to swear in Lyndon Johnson on that plane, who, by the way, is the only U.S. president ever to have been sworn in by a woman. Um, local hmm. U.S. district judge, I forget her name, um, and they, like, scooped her up and brought her onto Air Force One, and she swore in the president of the United States. Um, hmm. uh you know, they knew to swear him in because Kennedy was dead. Um, and um, there's no, um, but they realized, holy shit, if he was not dead, but merely in a coma, 
we wouldn't know what to do. And they all kind of went back in their minds to Woodrow Wilson, who by then it was really known and understood that Edith Wilson was running the White House uh, for a number of months, kind of in secret. And they said, well, nobody elected the first lady. And so let's figure something out. And that's how the 25th Amendment came about. It was really because of a, we almost had this situation uh, kind of realization. But and don't you a, think that hopefully that's the situation that we end up being in here? Like is like an what? almost situation? Judge Sarah Hughes. Thank you, Mike Godwin. Um, uh, she um, she was an, actually an extremely accomplished um, uh, uh, woman. I remember when I read her obit, I was like, wow, she's really interesting. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I'm just not sure what the lesson is here. Is the lesson that, that the transition starts when the networks call it? Which no, doesn't but like, seem do we right. want? No, why do we? And like someone, I think it was David Kay pointed at this out on on Twitter was that like, isn't it kind of weird that we entrust to the private, to the to the private press, like to call our president? Like that seems straight, like a strange way of doing things. Like, and once you think of it that way, we were so normalized to it that it's fine. But like, right? I, I don't think not... the press does it at all. Because they're not calling the president, right? The president is based on the electoral college, so exactly. they're talking. They're calling the part of the process that will lead to the electoral college. So, and, and I, you know, I've heard Republicans saying this, and I understand their point. It seems like a good talking point. That I heard Giuliani mocking this. Oh, the media! The media get to call it. Media is a plural of medium, and medium is a means of conveyance. And what they're doing is accurately conveying where the votes stand in these states. So it is good. Yeah. To they're but coalescing right now, all of right these Right now, you don't interests. have to trust the media, right? The You can look at the reported results by the secretaries of state of the relevant states. Yes. And, you know, you can see that there's about 120,000 vote margin in uh, Michigan. There's about a 45,000 vote margin in uh, um in Pennsylvania, I don't remember what it is in Wisconsin, but it's, you know, somewhere in the 20, 30,000 mm -hmm. vote range, uh, 15,000 votes in Georgia. I mean, you don't actually need to trust the media at this point. 10,000 votes ish in Arizona. Um, and you can look at it and you can say, all right, well, how many votes are out? Well, we kind of don't know. So maybe if you're the head of GSA, you can say honestly, uh, hey, I'm part of a presidential administration that doesn't recognize this as over. I can't look at this and say it's over, but I, I'm i not sure, like the law invests in her, not in me, the discretion to make that judgment, but I don't really know how you would write it differently to compel a different outcome here unless you were to say, um, hey, you know, let's go by the Associated Press, which doesn't actually sound like the right answer. Yeah. Let me let me go back to your you don't understand his play. I understand it in terms of not actually winning the election, but getting Are there antlers want, behind right? you. Huh? Are there antlers behind you? Because there are these things that look like antlers. Ah, OK. You got a tail. Yeah. OK. It was a tail, not an That's antler. Right. Yes. All right. Excellent. <laughs> so moving, moving along from my hairless cat. The, Is that a hairless cat? Yes. Is it one is of it the hairless me? cats it, that look like Vladimir Putin? This is this is a very, very Bigglesworthian cat. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, my God. That is the coolest. He what? also was a Taekwondo champion. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> <God>. <laughs> so you don't understand the play in terms of winning the election. I agree. There is no play. Think back to the things he's done during his administration. We're like, why would he do that? And so often, I, I'm just thinking maybe you have a better, more tangible example. But so many of his initial court filings, which every legal expert said, well, this is not going to stand up to scrutiny, and it never did. So there's always an explanation, which is usually a motion or a fit of peak. But you can play out why he and others in his orbit would want to nurse the grievance and nurse the idea that this election was unfairly stolen from him, right? And it's not to actually retain power. It's 
it's just to retain influence, to retain mind share. You know, the QAnon is going on as this, you know, powerful force. These people will believe you no matter what. So unlike everyone else who's ever been president, where the incentives line up for you to graciously step off the stage and get paid a lot of money for your memoirs, I think money has something to do with it. The monetary and emotional incentives for Trump are aligning, just be totally amoral. They are aligning for him to do shit like this. And they are aligning, I guess, in the minds of a lot of senators for them to go along. Or maybe, you know, they're not sure the results of the election were in a repudiation of Trumpism. So we'll go along as long as we can. But I do see a logic to why he would play this out without any chance of, quote unquote, winning because his playing field is not actually staying in office. Okay, but let me let me let me probe that for a minute. So are you saying that at a conscious level? He knows he's lost. He mm -hmm. knows he's going to leave on January 20th. Um, but and he's not actually trying to do anything that will make a difference in terms of that. Um, but at a fully conscious level, he's just saying this is the best way for me to go out for my own future prospects. Yes, I essentially, yes. Uh, if you read Ben Smith's um, story on Maggie Hamer, I mean, he had that phrase about how she often reports that Trump is less stupid, but more, did, did he say, she say emotional? Less stupid, but more um, incompetent than readers would think. And there is, I don't think it's, I don't think it's stupidity going on. I don't think it's sheer gimlet eyed strategy. But I do think it's a combination of how he navigates the world and how he does things and knowing what his next play might be. And everything, every bit of stimulus has always told him that the nursing of grievances and that the uh, rallying of people who agree with him always redounds to his benefit in whatever his next enterprise is going to be. So why so not? You, so you don't think it's emotional denial. You don't think he's in denial. You think he's actually making a cynical calculation, this is the best play for me strategically. I mean, he's he's also a guy who hates to lose and will never admit losing. But yeah, I think it's strategic. I mean- but I don't I, think it's cynical for him, Ben. Well, it's like, objectively, if what Mike is describing is correct, it's objectively cynical. That's right. His, like, he's motivated by self-interest, which is the definition of cynicism. Yeah, I mean, but I, I guess for us, I guess as an external perspective, it's cynicism. But for him, I just think it's like the normal, the normal way of things. And he's just got this. But I completely agree with you, Mike. I think that this is, this is really, this is about staying consistent with the brand that he's built during not only his campaign but his time in presidency and there was like i remember if you think back like four years ago there was kind of like this moment where we're like well maybe he'll be a different person once he becomes president because he can't literally keep up this all caps twitter account crazy conspiracy shoot like theory peddling bullshit but he's the president of the united states and then he did and like it was just kind of so i think that i think that it's his brand above all else and he's going to be making if he can't make money off of it which i'm he that i think is his biggest concern next right. um uh more so than even being president again um for sure all I right i want to i want to throw one one other yeah. thing out there and this was driven home for me in tubin's really excellent book on the Mueller report i know you risk saying tubin in such a forum maybe is tempting the gods but what Tubin points out is that as I am much as just, we, I'm just, I'm not wearing pants today. Just <laughs> just, and, and, and you can't see my arms, so you have no <laughs> idea what's going on in the screen that you can't see. That's where we can see them. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the advanced Tubin, if you could. Anyway, <laughs> um, as, as much of a mockery as Rudy Giuliani and the legal team seemed, they actually did a decent job in terms of playing Mueller. Uh, maybe it was more secular, maybe it was more Ty Cobb, but it did seem to be Giuliani leading the way, 
achieve Trump's objectives. So maybe he's also saying, all right, here's another crazy case. Rudy's saying these things to me. It worked last time. Let's just go with that. All right, I want to float a different hypothesis. One thing really quickly, Ben, I forgot to tell you that I talked to my source at the White House about what the hell happened with the Four Seasons thing. Because, like, that was because everyone's been talking about this. And I'm just kind of like, and his take, he was like, I'm not involved with the campaign at all. So, but like, basically, the like, I assume, and the what scene sounds like everyone is assuming was that it was a huge mistake. And then they just ran with it. And Giuliani is not in any way connected officially with the campaign and is just off there on his own doing his own thing as like this mercenary for yeah, the president. He's merely the president's lawyer. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so, um, and so, but anyways, but he was as, but I was a little surprised that there hadn't been back channeled. He would have told me there, there would have, there hadn't been back channeled an explanation for the four seasons thing. But um, yeah, even he thought that it was pretty fucked up. But we, we so, know it's a mistake, but the question is, where was the, on whose part was the mistake? Was it Trump mistaking where the actual event was? Was it the, the trying to book it? And then they said, all right, we'll go with the landscaping folk. He was going to poke around, but he said that he thought the mistake had occurred before uh, that Trump had prematurely tweeted. Well, you'll all be pleased to know that somebody uh, showed me before the show today a rewrite of the opening scene of Macbeth, uh, <laughs> where the three witches have the following dialogue. Where shall we three meet again in, in thunder, <laughs> lightning, and in rain when the mm -hmm. hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won? <laughs> that'll be ere the setting sun. Where the place four seasons uh, <laughs> land, total landscaping, um, which seems like the only thing to do. Um, uh, I love the the cat just walking yeah, back and forth. It's Eye of New Tale of Cat. Yeah, I'm exactly. Not, it's it's got that it's got that whole back. Macbeth yeah. thing like, going. I I'm Mike. I have new respect for you and your naked cat. This is this cat is so cool and it matches your it matches your own. It matches your whole like ethos. Yeah. Someday oh. um, I'm going to. Do, so, you know, the listicle 10, uh, 20 hairless cats that look like Vladimir Putin, um, which is like the world, the most famous listicle in the history of listicles. <laughs> I know the person who was tasked with putting that listicle together. Ooh. And someday we should have him on uh, uh, in lieu of fun to talk, to tell the story of that listicle, um, which has a funny backstory. Um, so, um, uh, I have an alternative hypothesis, which is, um, uh, yes, Mike Godwin, it was from memory, which is why I almost instinctively said that'll be air the setting sun and got tripped up over the re relevant line. Um, uh, my alternative hypothesis is um, that actually he is sufficiently narcissistic that he is incapable of of actually processing that he lost mm -hmm. and the entire fabric of the federal government. It's not cynical. It's actually that he's emotionally incapable of it and that he, that the entire apparatus of the federal government is being turned on its head in order to flatter his uh, narcissistic delusion. Why are you why are you skeptical of that? Well, in general, I think okay, I'm not an expert in psychology, but I think we often reach for no, but the we're all armchair goes, psychologists. To now. him, it's the truth. To him, he's to in totally a different parallel reality. I don't think people who can function to the extent that Donald Trump or someone like that can function are in totally different realities. But, you know, they pick and choose what portions of the real reality they like. And his past experience has shown him that a fair amount of denial plus a fair amount of fighting plus what I articulated, which is you can get something out of denying the actual truth, is in his interest. And if he was in total denial, right, like he really thought up was down, why would he be making these, you know, stuffing these appointments? I, I'm using the wrong phrase, not recess appointments, but he's acting as if 
uh, in many ways, administratively acting like a guy who's lost the election, right? So how could he both be acting like that and be in total denial that he's lost the election? Or is it underlings who are executing these moves? Interesting. Should we go to audience questions, Kate? Yeah, totally. I, you know, the other thing we haven't talked about is the GSA. And I'm curious, has she like said what she's waiting for exactly? Like, is she waiting from an order from the president? Is that what she's like? Wait, is she waiting from our pronouncement from the electors? Like, is that, um, is that what has, or is it just that she's just not doing it? She has not said what her threshold will be. She says it is not, uh, uh, she is complying with the law and she has not yet ascertained, which is the language of the law, that there is an apparent winner. Uh, she is correct that that is the, uh, uh, that is the uh, language of the law. She is also correct that it is a matter of her uh, uh, discretion. And um, uh, I think it is fair to say that in the past, people have exercised their discretion a little bit more aggressively than she has in <laughs> terms of uh, determining that uh, a transition should begin. She's being David, very discreet, very, very yes. discreet with her discretion. David Botts, the floor is yours. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, great to see everybody. Hi, Mike, big fan. Um, what do you consider to be the most surprising and important lesson of the election. And as Georgia gets ready to elect both senators, what types of attacks or dirty tricks within the state and nationally should Democrats be prepared to manage? Well, I'll leave lesson. Let's talk Georgia. I think a lesson should be is not to regard any and all money coming in as money that needs to be spent on the airwaves. I was in Maine during that Senate race, and I think it really turned people off how much money was thrown at Susan Collins, who the people of Maine didn't think was the devilish nightmare she was made out to be. And eh, maybe it would work better with Kelly Leffler. But you know, even David Perdue, who I don't hold in high regard, I think most people in Georgia think, well, he's you know, just regular standard fair senator and not Satan incarnate. So one thing is I will caution the Democrats and all the national Democrats who are going to be given, you know, combined hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars in this elections to maybe keep your powder dry. Patrick Gunn, the floor is yours. Um, so Ben, uh, I, uh, howdy. Uh, I was, hey. um, so recently I saw on Twitter, and I know that's maybe a little weird to, to poke people on, on what they say on, on Twitter here, but, uh, but totally it's fair. the show. Um, you, uh, so there's this issue of, of <clears throat> how, we, uh, how we treat the lawyers of people involved in Trump's legal efforts. And you mentioned that earlier you had a you had a pretty strong position based on a lot of prior cases that we should never go after lawyers for the stances uh, for defending clients and, and for their legal activity. And I think that this is a, a really strong case. I entirely agree with it for defense lawyers. But I wanted to poke at you a little bit about the possibility of there being a, a difference between defense lawyers and lawyers used uh, more on the offense side. And whether you th uh, whether you might want to reconsider or nuance or address the just address the argument of the potential difference between defense lawyers and lawyers used on offense. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question, and it's a really interesting distinction that you're making. And I want to uh, I want to emphatically stand by the position that I took at the beginning of the Obama administration. Look. If the president of the United States has a case to make that there was impropriety in with regard to the election, some lawyer is going to make it. Um, and it may be Rudy Giuliani. It may be some total nincompoop incompetent. Um, I want these issues ventilated as quickly as possible, as well as possible. 
by Jones Day, by really good law firms, so that you can then say, hey, they took their best shot. You know, they they went 0 for 17, which is, I think right now they're 0 for 12 and 5 with five or six cases pending. Uh, and they were well represented in the process. I don't think it does any good. Just as, by the way, if you have a death row inmate and you get some some incompetent representing them to ra raise their claims, it doesn't really do any good to have that ventilated that way. And then, you know, people like me come in and say, Jesus Christ, any reasonable lawyer would have raised X, Y, and Z. And then it's the night before their execution mm -hmm. and there are still outstanding issues and it sucks. And, you know, I was in, you know, in one such case, I went for literally more than 10 years believing somebody was innocent until actually a DNA test more than a decade later showed that he was actually guilty as charged. Um, it really confuses things when you don't have issues well presented. And so my feeling is, first of all, I don't really believe in, in I don't believe the distinction that you're describing is a stable one um, mm. in the sense that, you know, so who the Guantanamo lawyers that I was defending were on offense, not on defense. They were filing collateral attacks on, on uh, you know, their clients weren't being prosecuted. They were filing collateral attacks on, 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 on detentions. These were civil litigations just like this. Um, mm. Now you can say, well, they were for people who were locked up, but frankly, Trump probably should be locked up. So, you know, that's a, you know, that's, I'm not sure that's a distinction with a great difference. Um, mm. So I basically think that we should have, the, the rules should be, you don't go after lawyers. The other thing is, if you go after these Jones Day lawyers, realistically, you're going after their families too. Um, because they're going to get calls at home and their kids are going to pick up the phone. And and so I don't you know, I like I love the Lincoln Project. I don't approve of this. And I don't think it's a good I don't think it's a good strategy. I don't think they um, I don't think it's a I don't think it's effective. And I also just think it creates an environment in which. Lawyers have to think about taking on clients. They have enough mm. reason to think about it already. And I would rather that all issues are well presented in the first instance, the first time, so we don't litigate it a hundred times. That's my so, view. I know it's really like people don't buy it, but that's that's what I think. Can I can I plus one that just really quickly? Because I think yeah, it please. also relates to kind of it, like a larger idea of um, sh online shaming or shaming generally uh, that we've kind of gotten into the habit of doing. And like, I mean, like we don't like what Facebook is doing. You're going to start like attacking everyone that you know that works for Facebook or everyone you know that works for Google or whatever else. I mean, just like that, like, like there, there is a level of attenuation between, you know, working for a company that does X and um, a lot of companies are able to do pro bono defense or companies, law firms are able to do pro bono defense work for questionable clients in part because they do work for big tobacco or they do mm -hmm. lobbying for like crappy politicians that we don't like, you know, but they are able to, but that's kind of the cycle of things. I think putting the blast on one tiny element of their business model, especially when the business model is one in which you have some type of like, kind of obligation to represent people is uh is like i just i like i i disagree with it more than i disagree with even like typical like online shaming or uh, shaming kind of uh, attacks that people per, uh kind of perpetuate there are so many cats on this show right now yeah we got we got an overabundance <laughs> of cats tony kava the floor is yours hi tony Hi, Kate. We are not cat people. Cats are cats are evil. Yeah. We established that when Tom <laughs> Nichols was here. Dachshund, I mean, a cat lawyer. lawyer. A cat lawyer. Yes. Um, my question is about uh, circling back around to Mike Pompeo today. 
And I'm just curious if, you know, what, what was he actually trying to do? I mean, was he, you know, was he serious? Was he just joking or trolling or joking and trolling, which is kind of, uh, you know, be behavior you expect from the nation's top diplomat? Um, or was he, was it like a intentional uh, uh, effort to kind of shift the Overton window with this kind of gaffe? And just slowly but surely, these guys are just moving that window till it gets to the point where everyone's, well, yeah, of course you got to recount the votes in Georgia. How did you read it, Mike? Well, it's communicating through humor in a way that gives you plausible deniability like Russia, if you're listening, exactly <laughs> like that. It's classically yeah. in keeping with some of the Trump rhetorical tools. Hey, it was a joke. Hey, it was a joke. Oh, you believed it? Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, the joke never goes in the other direction, does it? He never no. said, well, obviously the greatest That's president in the point. United States, Joe Biden, has just won. No, never won. So very irresponsible for men in that position. Yeah, yeah just uh, to foot stomp that, one of the jobs of the top diplomat in the country is to make the position of the United States clear. <laughs> and if you're trolling by being intentionally ambiguous as to whether you are being humorous, one thing you were not doing is making the position of the United States clear. So think about this from the point of view of a foreign government that may not have a tradition of uh, the peaceful transition of power and may actually believe that elections are shams because in their country they are, uh, say, oh, Russia. Um, what is, how would that message be received by Dmitry Peskov? Um, I'm not going to assert the answer to that question because I don't know how sophisticated a viewer of American uh, politics Peskov is, but I don't think it's an obvious question. And if you're Mike Pompeo, your job is to give a sense of, like, give a clear sense of the U.S. position and of course, the U.S. position right now should be we have a presumptive president elect. It's not final until the electoral college meets, but um, we follow this set of rules. And under this set of rules, Joe Biden is going to be the next president of the United States. And that's how we roll here. And that was not communicated with that sentence. Diplomacy is a communicative act. And soft power rests on the assertion that um, the United States is a leader in the correct mores of the world. And when you do this incorrectly in that position, especially, you're really violating what the purpose of the position is. It's hard. It's really horrible. Mr. Grossman, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for being here. Um, huge fan of the gist. Uh, I'm curious how, if, if you think that there's any way to sort of bridge the right left information gap that we have, you know, I find most concerning the, not the low information voter, but the, what I think is the large portion of people on the right that feel like they're engaged in civic education. They consider themselves well-informed. They pride themselves on having done their research, but the research that they're looking into is, you know, YouTube videos, it's Dan Bongino, it's OAN, like they feel like they're engaged, they feel like they've done their homework, but it's in such a misguided way that, you know, there's, you know, 70% of the Republicans think that the election was stolen. So, you know, short of a hologram of Walter Cronkite coming back to host the evening news and it's one news source for everyone to um, get their information from, I just, I don't, I don't see a path for where we can get everyone in the country back sort of agreeing on the, just the basics of our society. Is, is there a path? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know that you need it to have the uh, the shared basics um, on every issue, on most issues. I think that returning to a Fox News of some f toe touches with 
you know, birtherism in a couple of the shows, but a Fox News where they have different values. I'm not even talking about an imagined Fox News where Fox News is the equivalent of MSNBC just from a rightward perspective. I think just eliminating some of the um, conspiracy theories, some of the stuff that I think Twitter and Facebook did a pretty good job of tamping down would be a huge stride. Because I do think that as much as liberal viewers watch Fox News and say to themselves, oh, my God, that's full of misinformation, there is a market need for that. And conservative minded people aren't being shaped by Fox News as much as they are seeking out things that uh, affirm their worldview. And really, the same goes on at MSNBC. I was just actually discussing the differences between two, because one of my theses with the election is, you know, it's a terrible thing that the United States is now a bifurcated country between essentially the educated and the not educated. And I put this to the person I was talking to. Give me an example where rule by the less educated has been good for a country. Just it's very hard to find. And the Fox News viewer is, in fact, less educated than the MSNBC viewer. You know, I'm looking at some statistics here. Thirty five percent of Fox News viewers uh, only went to high school. Twenty three percent of MSNBC viewers only went to high school among college or postgraduates. Fox News, 29 percent of viewers, a college graduate or postgraduate among MSNBC, 43 percent. So to some extent, it's what the media is saying and how they're shaping people. But to another extent, it's the media, uh, the people seeking out the sort of media that affirms their worldview and just stopping the most horrible things from getting out there. So I want to just like, I just kind of want to two finger that and kind of just say that I think that there, that that is exactly correct. as in like a definite, like as a descriptive assessment of like where we are in terms of bifurcation. But I, I am going to add that I think that even putting it like the idea that you put it in terms of educated and non-educated, Mike, I think that that is part of what drives the resentment and the gap. So yeah. I think that the people that are the uneducated feel as if they are talked down to and like lectured to by the educated, like you don't know what's good for you. And the paternalism is like dripping and the, and the condescension is dripping. And like everyone in my like, and I know that this is just like so anecdotal data, right? This is like, this is just my, like my family and the people that I know that have voted for Trump and like everything else. But like, like 201, there's almost this, just like this palpable ex expressed, they say it, like a resentment of feeling talked down to, like feeling like liberals don't approve of them if they're a woman and they decide to stay at home and raise kids, like feeling like they don't, you know, they don't think that, you know, that there's, you know, feeling that like they don't, you know, the fact that they're, that they have like, that they're a member of the NRA makes people think that they're violent immediately yeah. or like, you know, like all of these types of things. And all of this is kind of like, that is like, I just wish that we could just change the message to have a little more empathy in it and to just stop being so just like rip roaring kind of, and like AOC, in my opinion, is maybe one of the worst on this. I feel like she is like, I speak for the people. And then she talks, like, she just like talks down to people in a lot of her speeches. Well, and a even lot the words and the the phrases themselves that are just so impenetrable to people who not only maybe didn't have a college education, but a recent college education. You know, it's derided on the right as bodies and spaces, but there is so much, so many code words, so much uh, entry into this, you know, recondite sphere. It really is off-putting. It is not, this is not how Sherrod Brown or someone who, you know, knows how to speak, a Democrat who knows how to speak to, you know, workers without a college education. These are not the words they use, but the words they use. Maybe they, he would say the words. They, the, these are not the words they use. And it, I really do think it's a terrible trend that you have to come up with these code words, that you have to come up with these labels, that there's some sort of entry into having a conversation at all to feel that. All right. We got three more questions from three awesome erudite people. I want to get through them all. Uh, so let's keep questions relatively brief and keep answers relatively brief. Mike Godwin. Hi. I'm glad, I'm glad you have resolved your Crowdcast issues. Uh, quick question. Are we allowed to call each other Nazis again now that the Trump era is heading for an end? Well, let me put it this way. I could hardly stop you. Uh, 
<laughs> All right, then, you fucking Nazi. <laughs> I could hardly stop you. I don't know why my cam isn't working. Can you see me? No, we can see yeah, you can just see fine. All right, well, mine isn't working on mine. That's okay. I know how I look. Um, so I, I, since we want to keep it short, I'll, I'll cut the Shakespeare from memory quote that I was going to do. But what I will ask is the uh, kind of a, an Occam's razor question, because I hear a lot of theories interpreting what's going on you know, Bill, what Bill Barr is doing, what the majority leader is doing, you know, Pence's communications and so on, that are all trying to explain away why this thing that looks kind of like aligning for a coup attempt isn't really aligning for a coup attempt. And so my question is really about the fact that Occam's razor suggests that the simplest theory is the most likely to be correct. At least it's a, it's a heuristic. But the only other theory that seems to be almost as simple as the coup lining up for an attempted coup is the fact that they're trying to recover money from gullible uh, uh, donors, donors, you know, to save the election. But it's really going to retire campaign debt. Uh, so I just wanted to advance that as a candidate theory to see what you guys thought. Great question. What do you think, Mike? Is there any explanation as simple as we're going to have a coup? We're in the we're in the offing stages of a coup, uh, and uh, is there any reason to believe Occam's razor could be wrong in this instance, or uh, is this a grift? Is that yeah. the simple well, explanation? Occam's razor is both? the use, use of a razor <laughs> to cut cut a Gordian knot, or just to cut a knot. And to a razor is a weapon. So have they done anything to get the military on board? Have they done anything to get the police on board? If you don't, if you do all this planning and it's all done within, I don't know, the, the offices of the Justice Department, it seems like it's not going to work. I'd go with Grift. There are the recurring donation buttons on all the emails that go out to everyone who's been on a Trump list. Never underestimate the griftiness of these people. What do you think, Kate? Grift, coup, or something else? Oh, I think it's a grift. I don't think, for one, I got it, I, I, and I'll say this again, and I'm surprised more people, I haven't seen, probably people are saying this, and because I never read the news, I'm not seeing it, but, like, the man wants to make money again. He's, like, literally ha made, an, an, like, this huge, like, all of this, we just saw with the tax returns, half of his money is coming from, like, all of the royalties off of The, the Apprentice. He wants another reality TV show or something. Like, he wants, like, that would be great for him. Like, that, like... I feel like this is this is just not how he really wants to live his life. He's loving the last few minutes of such incredible attention and power. And then he's going to move on. All right. I'm going to go with something else. Not grift, not coup, but psychological placation of the narcissist is the simplest explanation for this. Uh, and today's poll is going to be which of these three do you think it is, or is it something else? Is this post-election bullshit colon A, a coup, B, a grift, C, psychological, not O psychological, psychological placation, of the narcissist. Wow, it's amazing how bad my typing gets. After, with one whiskey. Uh, with one whiskey or other. Here you go, people. Um, all right, which brings us to former president Tomas Ilvis. It's my favorite former president. It's the only one who regularly shows up <laughs> on In Lieu of Fun. But wait, why is Tomas not showing up on the screen? Um, where'd I you love go, watching Tomas? The come in on the polls. It's yeah, really fun. it's like, all right, we're going to bring in Christopher Argyris, whose name I'm going to get correct this time, while we figure out what's wrong with Tomas's uh, feed. Christopher, the floor is yours. Did I get your name right this time? Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Mike, getting back to our sports uh, journalist roots. Um, Best sports analogy for the 2020 uh, election aftermath. I'm thinking Super Bowls. Uh, Democrats think they're 49ers over the Broncos, 55-10. Uh, uh, and Trump thinks that he's the Patriots uh, uh, against the Falcons down 28-3 and going to come back to win. 
What's what's your uh, your take? I think he's like Seahawks fans forever arguing a pass interference in the end zone <laughs> that was called on the field. I got. I'm like gonna go with four year cricket game. Like that seems right to me. <laughs> like, just, and there's there's no winner, and in the end, it's just kind of like what somebody you know, yeah, walks off the field. So. What do you think the best sports metaphor for the entire Trump administration is? Cleveland uh, Brown, nineteen nineteen Black Sox. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, we're on the day ooh, couple of times. Ooh, Black Sox. <laughs> but they were actually very good to begin with, so we have to broaden. Yeah, and they had, and they had a four hundred hitter. Is skydiving yeah. metaphor. What if like a sky a skydiving accident? Is that a sport? <laughs> no. I do All think right. That, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I think that there was a phenomenon like with Cubs fans and Red Sox fans before they won the World Series going on with Democratic voters thinking that they can't win until they win. And then when they won, maybe not accepting it or maybe even forgetting that there was ever a time when they thought it wasn't possible. I think the best sports metaphor for the Trump administration is the old uh, ski jumping clip from the agony of defeat, ABC Sports. I think that just sums it all up. Tomas, (laughs) you get the last last question. question. Okay, quickly. um, Today there was news that Nunes Goon Cash Patel has just been made, uh, whatever I mentioned there, and Michael Ellis, Chief of Staff of the NSA. I mean, they're taking high positions. I, I heard the term called burrowing. I mean, is this till January twentieth, or is this some, or are these are these positions that where they can be fired at eleven or twelve forty seven on the twentieth of January? Do you have thoughts on this, Mike? The burrowing? no, I think I I want to know the factual answer. How, how long um, so ago? I can give you the factual know. answer to part of it. Um, okay. So the people who are being put in political positions like Cash Patel uh, will last exactly as long as Trump does. Um, they will, uh, as a general matter, their resignations will be sought in bulk uh, by the transition. They will be gone at noon on the 20th. Uh, and so you should be exactly as afraid uh, uh of Cash Patel and Ezra Cohen, whatever the hell his name is, um, uh, Watkins, Cohen, Cohen Watkins, um, as you are of what they can do in the next couple months. Uh, Michael Ellis is a different matter because the general counsel of NSA is actually a civil service position. So this is literally a burrowing situation. Uh, And um, my guess, but I'm not sure, is what you're going to see here is some slow walking of the, um, uh, you know, the security clearance issues, the the sort of formalities. This is clearly not something that General Nakasone, who is a very serious and very non political guy, who has done an exceptional job protecting his agency uh, from Trump. I mean, you know, if you think about the last several years, we've had a lot of scandals about the FBI, a lot of shit about the CIA and Gina Haspel. You've heard nothing about NSA. And that is a testament to how good a job General Nakasone has done. um, And as well as what Cybercom has been able to do in just kind of keeping themselves out of, and you know, if you think about the four years before that, where they were in the news all the time, which is not where they want to be, Uh, This is a real accomplishment on Nakasone's part. So the last thing he wants is this guy in this position. And my guess is you will see it slow walked if it is, uh, if if he is, if Ellis is installed in that position before January 20th, uh, getting him out, it's going to be a little tricky because it is a civil service position with civil service protections. And I think he can be moved around by the director of the agency, but he can't simply be fired the way a, a political appointee can. So this is actually something to watch. And I think a bigger deal than the other, uh, than the Ezra uh, Cohen Watnick stuff or the, um, 
or the uh, 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 Cash Patel stuff. Either that stuff is like Stephen Miller. They will be uh, washed away with the flood. Um, uh, but the Michael Ellis thing is a serious issue. Sorry to end on a down note. I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. Let's end on this note. I thought of a good sports analogy, and it's the USFL. <laughs> i like it that is excellent that's very good uh, very good well that brings us to the end of another hour of in lieu of fun neither tide nor technical foul nor canoe accident could keep us from the show today uh tomorrow will be episode 230 which will be only one 135 episodes from a full year of in lieu of fun. I don't know why. Yeah, maybe we should start talk counting backwards. Counting down to yeah. No. yeah. Um uh Mike Pesca, you're a great American. Um for those of you who don't listen to the gist, you really should. It's uh it's it's uh one of only two podcasts I literally listen to every day, though I almost always listen to it a few days late because of that's the way my feed rolls. Uh, it holds up really well if you listen to it late. If you get to it two weeks late, it's not a problem. Uh, it lasts. Um, and uh, tomorrow, who do we have, Kate? We have Jonathan Rausch. Yeah. And then we have David French on Thursday. David French on Thursday, um, uh, my mystery guest who was going to come talk to us about vaccines cannot do it uh, for reasons of another matter. So we are going to get somebody else to come talk about vaccines. Um, until then, this will all start 22 hours and 58 minutes from now. And until then, let's see if Mike can do the sign off today. Mike? <laughs> You have to prompt me more in lieu of fun. We don't have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun. Yes. And then you fill it in. Oh, okay. I, I listen. It took me like 15 times to understand <laughs> that too, Mike. It's okay. But in, but in lieu of fun, might I offer this fillet of a finny snake? <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't understand it either, but you and know, call for boil and bake. Come on. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, double, good. double toil and trouble.